You are welcome to this preview of the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, reading from the New English Translation of 2019, with variant readings from 5th century or earlier manuscripts. Suggestions for adult Bible study leaders. Invite others to read aloud the current text or verses. Provide historical, cultural, or grammatical information about the passage that others may not know. Always ask for others' observations before you share your own. Then pose queries that can be answered by looking at the current text or from other well-known texts. Then, instead of correcting or contradicting others' views, offer a better view as an alternative. If your alternative view is really superior, others will recognize it as so without your having to say so. If someone else proves argumentative, then thank him for his view and proceed to another text or pose another query. Here is our working outline of the Epistle to the Ephesians in nine teaching points. In this text, we are moving on to the section on exhortation towards spiritual life. The structure of these verses 1 through 16 follows this plan. Therefore, referring back to the information previously presented, Paul presents an exhortation to walk worthily of our call. He will then offer three explanations for this exhortation. First, whether Jew or Gentile, we've been called to one and the same blessings. Secondly, Christ gives grace to each one of us, but also Christ gives workers to churches. They have a fourfold purpose, to equip us for ministry, to mature us, to conform us to Christ, and to edify us or build us up. Have someone read aloud verses 1, 2, and 3. If you are studying alone, stop the video and read these verses carefully. Then proceed. After you have invited others to make their observations or to pose their queries, you might ask, how does character relate to salvation? Of course, we are already called to salvation, and now we are exhorted to live according to the grace of God. Then, how does gentleness differ from weakness? By definition, the Greek term for gentleness, prautes, means to suppress or control our anger. Note that it takes great strength to control our anger. Then, how can we show love to those who are less lovely. This calls for tolerance, patience, putting up with one another, because God loves them as much as he does us. And how does peace relate to unity? Because we belong to the same Christ, we already exist in unity. Now we are to seek to live together peacefully. For those who are philosophically inclined, Ask someone to define Christian stoicism, that is, showing great patience. As an explanation, Paul offers verses 4 through 6. After someone has read this aloud and others have shared their views, you might ask, what is the point of all this oneness? Think about Jews and Gentiles now having all things in common. He mentions seven things. We are one body. That is, there is no real division, whether by ethnicity, language, culture, economics, or religious background. There is one spirit, and therefore no distinction between the more spiritual and the less. We have one hope, that is, the same destiny. And one Lord. We're all seeking to obey him. There is one faith, that is, we are all loyal to the same Lord. And one baptism, that is, regardless of method, formula, or administrator, all who have been baptized are received as genuine Christians. 
and there is one Father God, to whom we are all grateful, full of thanks. However, though we have unity around these seven realities, each one has many expressions. For example, there is one body, but many gatherings, fellowships, associations, denominations. There is one spirit, but many experiences. We do not all show the same manifestations of that spirit. There is one hope, but there are many calendars that have been formulated to describe the realization of our hope in terms of future things. Though there is one Lord, he has given us many leaders. One faith, yet a variety of theologies. You probably know several different Christian theologies held by faithful brothers and sisters. Though there is only one baptism, there are many methods. And though one father, there are many liturgies, many ways in which to worship him. So, you might discuss, when does unity require uniformity? Must we all act, think, dress, and speak alike? Regarding our one baptism, you might ask, what does baptism accomplish? Here are five views held by various Christians. Some say that baptism proclaims and completes a candidate's conversion to Christ. Others prefer to call baptism a kind of sign and seal of conversion, completing a candidate's entry into the covenant community, that is, the church. Then there are those who believe that baptism is a candidate's personal testimony to accomplished conversion. Others prefer to say, baptism is the community's incorporation of a candidate, that is, the means by which we receive new believers into our churches. And fifthly, there are those that hold that baptism is no more than a ceremony celebrating a candidate's conversion, much as a wedding celebrates a couple's marriage. What do all of these views have in common, making them one baptism? They are all performed in obedience to Jesus, who said, Go make disciples of all nations by baptizing them and by teaching them to obey my commands. Back to the text, have someone read aloud verses 7 and 8. After others have shared their views, you might wish to ask, which Christians are gifted for service? Clearly from the text, each one. And how does one earn or obtain a desired gift? Well, we don't. It is Christ who distributes gifts. Then, who measures out each one's gifts? Again, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, through the work of his Holy Spirit. And who is the giver of gifts from God? For emphasis, again, we stress, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the text says, He ascended on high, he captured captives. Whom did he take captive? Were these, were these the souls of Old Testament saints? Or were these defeated spirits whom he has now led into hell? Let's look at that text more carefully from Psalm 68, 18. Paul wrote, When he, Christ, ascended on high, he captured captives, he gave gifts to men. However, in the Hebrew Bible, the text reads, You ascend on high, you have taken many captives, you received tribute from men. Speaking of Messiah's victory over the earth. When the Hebrews translated that verse into Greek, they wrote, You ascended on high, you led captivity captive, you received gifts by a person. However, by the first century, the time of Jesus and Paul, 
Jews began translating the Hebrew Bible into the Aramaic language, often expanding texts to add in their own meanings. Thus, the Targum of this passage reads, You ascended to the firmament, or the sky, O prophet Moses. You captured captives. You taught the words of Torah, the Bible. You gave gifts to the sons of men. Thus, Paul seems to have borrowed the language of the Targum with the meanings of the Hebrew Bible. Continue with verses 9 and 10. Note that the phrase, into the lower parts of the earth, is interpreted in different ways. Here are some options. Some say the lower parts refers to Sheol, the underworld, where the dead go. And so Christ removed and saved souls out of Sheol, leading them into heaven. Others say that the earth is the lower parts of the phrase heaven and earth, and thus he came to earth. Then others say this is an image of God coming down from atop his holy hill, Mount Zaphon, the mountain of the north, metaphors for the heavens. Which of these meanings best fits the context of verses 9 and 10? Read aloud verse 11. There are several interpretations as to what Paul meant by these five kinds of gifted workers. There is the secessionist view, which says that the very first apostles, prophets, and possibly those who wrote the evangels, the gospels, only, all of whom have died. Therefore, their offices have ceased. Then we have continuists, those who believe that Christ still gives divinely inspired apostles and prophets who speak authoritatively to the churches, a view celebrated by Bethel Church in Redding, California. And then there is the actualist view, which says that today, apostles, or what we call missionaries, prophets, better known as preachers, and evangelists, all those who go about winning believers for the Lord Jesus. Mm. Now, we note that the verb here, that he gave to the church, employs the timeless aorist tense in the Greek, which may be translated with any suitable time tense. You may translate, he gave, he has given, or he gives to this day. The phrase, and the shepherds and teachers, Teachers has neither the conjunction and nor the article the, making shepherds and teachers a single chromatical class of workers, leading to several interpretations. Some say that this is merely a stylistic linguistic touch, leaving teachers as a fifth category, whereas others teach that shepherds and teachers remain a continuing category after the death of the first apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Others suggest that shepherds and teachers are merely the local staff members of any local congregation. And yet others suggest that shepherds are teaching elders or shepherding teachers, that is, evangelical pastors. Five kinds of apostles are actually described in the New Testament. These include Jesus himself, who is our apostle and high priest. Then there were the twelve commissioned by Jesus. These, of course, have died and never been replaced. Then church planters in the New Testament, who were sent out by the Holy Spirit, are also called apostles, and messengers sent by churches to carry gifts to the poor are called apostles. And then there are false apostles, deceitful Christians, who pretend to be apostles in order to take money from churches that they did not plant, or from Christians whom they did not win to the Lord. So, which kind was Paul? 
Note that he may have been more than one of these kinds. All right, the goal then of the ministry of these gifted men and women is that we might attain maturity. Read verses 12 and 13. Note that verses 11 through 16 are one long sentence in Greek that we have to break up into smaller pieces in our own languages. So, discuss together, who is it that equips us? Is it Jesus himself? Is it these gifted workers? Or is it those whom these workers empower to minister to others? Or is the text telling us that all of these work together for our maturity? In your culture or in your denomination, are pastors paid to preach, whilst we laymen must freely do all of the work? If that seems a divisive question, then do not discuss it. Second goal is that we might learn to refuse deceit. Someone reads aloud verse 14. Note that the Greek sentence, so that, followed by a verb in the subjunctive mood, that we be or we become, and that we should speak, usually indicates the purpose of something, but sometimes it can indicate the result. So is this an order that we might no longer be as children, or are we no longer children? What are some common tricks by which preachers, politicians, and advertisers try to deceive us? One current political trick is to alter the results of social surveys or polls that will make rigged elections seem reasonable. A third goal is that we might practice love. Verses 15 and 16. What kinds of Christian activity give each of us joy, yet seems to help others too? That which you really enjoy doing for others, from which they are sincerely helped, indicates your spiritual gift. And what is meant by the phrase, gift-based ministry? Do we assign tasks in the church according to giftedness, or only by availability of those who may not be competent. And how can enjoying ourselves so much be called love? Well, loving others is always in turn a cause of great joy. To close your discussion, you might ask each one to share one truth, insight, belief, or action that they have learned from this text. And then for next time, Ask them to read a chapter of Ephesians each day in versions that they trust, and then to study Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, preparing comments and queries that they will share when they come back for the next session.